At what point were you told by your producer that you needed a script? Did you already have footage with Sierra? Yep, I already had footage with her. I'd shot some documentary stuff and then just some raw stuff of us kind of filming each other and just exploring where the movie could go. So there was a bit of a general sense, but my producer was just like, you have to write a script. You have to give me a 90 page script. And it was a brutal process. I mean, I've written scripts before, but never for something that is inspired by reality. And that was really tough. Like reconciling this documentary footage and the reality of her world with a fictionalized storyline and trying to keep the fictionalized storyline authentic feeling and still connected to the reality. So it was a torturous process. I like to write in shitty motels. Oh, wow. I did a lot of road trips and would stay in, you know, kind of like Bates Motel level places. I don't know why, I can just think straight when I do that. Uh, and, you know, a lot of writing just happened walking on the beach, you know, very early on. I went to Jarvis Bay in Australia, I smoked a joint and started asking questions. Why does anyone want to be ruined? What are people really wanting from their interaction with her? Is she a therapist? Does she heal people in some ways? These guys seem to be, you know, so enamored with her, like she's a, a goddess or, or you know, a, a healer. Like people said crazy things about her, you know, in terms of the influence that she had on their life, much beyond getting off, but actually had made them a better person. So just asking all these questions aloud, talking into my iPhone recorder, that was how I started finding, okay, what are the themes I really want to explore? So, you know, it's not just about sitting there writing on your laptop. It's, for me, it's a lot of voice recorder stuff. That's kind of how I do a lot of my uh, processing of ideas. I'm just wondering, were a lot of these men, men that were in charge, and so it kind of felt good to reverse roles, or I'm just assuming that? No, for sure there is that. And it's such a misnomer when you say a submissive male, because you meet these guys and they're high powered CEOs. Now that's a bit of a cliche. I'm not saying everyone is like a judge or a millionaire or something, but my take on human sexuality is it's very compartmentalized. If you have one of these fetishes, it's because you probably were exposed to something at a young age and something just got hardwired in your brain. To me, that doesn't have a lot to do with who you are in day-to-day -day life. They can be very separate. And I really found that a lot, you know, and some people are like, oh, these guys seem so normal when you meet them. <laughs> I already had made that cognitive jump. I was like, well, of course, they're just people. They just happen to get off on this thing that you find strange and it's almost a coincidence that they get off on that. You know, it doesn't define who they are. But uh, the film definitely looks at what happens if you bring a fantasy into reality and the dangers of that. Because sometimes it's better to keep your fantasies in a little box. We all want our fantasies to come true. I would say this film explores a little bit, well, what happens if that fantasy comes into reality? What happens if you live your fantasy? Maybe you should be careful what you wish for. And you went to a lot of conventions with her or? I did. And you got to see like meet and greets? And oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I met all the women doing this line of work. Amazing people, great friends of mine now. Oh, I got really deep. I got really deep into it. I went to the Adult Film Expo a few times in Las Vegas and, and uh, whew, man. I mean, again, talk about blurring the line between fantasy and reality. There's a giant party in the film and we threw a real mansion party in Las Vegas with real porn stars and people attending and clients. And it was like we were shooting these scripted scenes in a real party atmosphere. <laughs> so that was a crazy experience. Um, but again, it kind of reflected in the footage. It's got this gritty, authentic kind of feeling. So I was always trying to tap into that reality where possible, even if it's a scripted storyline, but this kind of bedrock of reality. It's funny, Borat, was a great inspiration for me. You know, the Sasha Baron oh, Cohen yes. uh -huh. film. Just the methodology. Again, that's a comedy, completely different tone, but you know, using reality as the foundation for this fictional storyline, that did it very effectively and that inspired me a lot, yeah. So you originally had the name, you, or excuse me, you originally had the name Ruin Me. Right. And then at what point did you find out there was another film with that name? You know, I would think in 2017, we became aware that there was an independent American horror movie called Ruin Me. And I was in denial for a while. I was like, that's okay. There's just gonna be two movies called Ruin Me, no problem. We all love the title Ruin Me. Um, but then you get to a point where you're just like, you know, it's not gonna work. Because people go to Google Ruin Me and their film comes up instead of yours, or people start buying the wrong thing on iTunes once it's available. So. 
you know, we just spoke to enough distributors and, and some friends who were sales agents or, you know, people in marketing. And they were like, you need your own identity. Have your own digital footprint. Don't confuse yourself in the marketplace. So it was tough, but we, we made the change. And now I prefer the title, Use Me. I really do, because addiction is quite a central theme in the movie. So the word use, using that concept, that kind of makes sense for this movie. Sure. Yeah. And both parties are using one another, you know? Yeah, and who's using who, right. and mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. Sure. So yeah, look, I mean, um, I, 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 wanna, I haven't seen the horror movie Ruin Me. I heard it's quite good, and you know, I wish those guys all the best. It's just a shame. It, I mean, I think it was, just a, it was just a coincidence. It happens sometimes. You both come up with the same title at the same time. They got theirs out first, so we kind of had to say, all right, you have it, and we'll change the name. Any tips for filmmakers that have, are saying, okay, I need to change the name? and we're already like picture locked or whatever. Any tips for them? Boy, it's tough. I mean, we had a four page document. <sighs> I would just say, figure out the essence of your original title. So we looked at it, okay, ruin me. You'd think that the word ruin is the key aspect of it. So we looked at ruined as a title, but it just wasn't as active. Then we came to realize that actually the me was the word, that command do something to me, that sense of a transaction. So we got rid of the word ruin, and then we thought, well, what else can be done? Okay, use me, yeah. you know? Mutually using each other. And, and it kind of begs the question of, yeah, who is using who? So I guess figure out what the essence of your title is, and there's usually another way you can express that, yeah. And then it, how many places did you have to then go? I mean, I'm sure on IMDb you had to go and change it and... Totally, yeah, it's a bit of a logistical nightmare. But better to do it while you're still in production and the film hasn't been released than later. Hmm. You don't want to change it after you've released it. So my advice is if there's any confusion in the marketplace, better just bite the bullet and, and just change your title. And if it's a good movie, I mean, titles are super important, don't get me wrong, but if it's a good movie, it's still gonna be a good movie no matter what you call it. Sure. Yeah. And you updated your uh, Kickstarter backers? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We were transparent about the whole process and, and you know, they were attached to the title Ruse, uh, Ruin Me, but now they, they love the title Use Me. So, That's great. yeah. And were most of these uh, backers, excuse me, I, I guess maybe you answered this previously, but were they f fans of Sierra or they were just in that space, whether they were consumers of that type of material? Or? Mm, uh, actually 50-50, you know. Um, obviously she's got a fan base who are gonna follow her and support projects that she wants to do creatively. And then people who are into BDSM or femdom. But at least 50% are people who have no interest in that world. Maybe they like films that I've done before. Maybe they just like thrillers. You know, we, we did manage to tap into an audience who was a little bit more mainstream. And that was great. That was actually what gave us a real shot in the arm and made us think, okay, this film hopefully can, can break out a little bit. You know, we don't want to just preach to the converted. We want to find you know, a wide audience for this film. So that was encouraging.